One thing that's striking about this period of high reconstruction is the speed, as I mentioned in the outset, with which African Americans throw themselves into formal political participation. You see this talked about in, among others, Han's book. You also see, in a slightly different context, Laura Edwards bringing attention to the speed with which African Americans threw themselves into like the high legal system, right? This thing that might right. seem like really detached from what the experience of like a slave would be like. Where does this agility with politics come from? That's an interesting question. You know, long ago, long ago, I had a, conf a conversation with uh, Stanley Elkins, famous for writing a book a long time ago called Slavery, which emphasized greatly the psychic damage to the slaves of being in this total institution, um, very controversially. Uh, and I was giving, this was early on in my work on Reconstruction, I was giving a talk about it, about this very thing about black politics, and afterwards he came up to me and he said, you know, this is fascinating, it's great, I really think this material is so interesting. And I said, in a polite sort of way, well, doesn't that, it, 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 doesn't it seem to cut against the, um, your picture of slaves before the war as lacking any notion of political identity mm -hmm. or anything? And he said, well, that's why the Civil War was a revolution. Mm -hmm. That's why this, that's what a revolution is. People change. That it all happens in this five years. It happens it in the revolution. Mm -hmm. As Robespierre said, when someone asked him, where were you born? He said, I'm a child of the revolution. I didn't exist before the revolution. Of course he did physically, but the Robespierre that we know. Now, that's one way of looking at it. I think it's limited. I think lately there's been a lot of emphasis on, and Hahn again is a pioneer in this, on the po politics of slaves, the mm -hmm. political yeah. ideas of slaves, political defined broadly, and not electoral politics so much as ideas about society and power and things like that. And in terms of the legal system, there's now a considerable number of people, Laura Edwards you mentioned, um, uh, Martha Jones, Rebecca Scott, others are seeing how particularly free blacks use the legal system to tremendous advantage before the Civil War and going into court and filing suits, even when they weren't really supposed to do so, doing it anyway. And even slaves tried to manipulate the legal system, although with obviously much more limits on what they could accomplish. Uh, so in other words, what we see in Reconstruction, I think, comes out of a long tradition. It may be a somewhat hidden tradition, but a tradition Despite the fact that I do think the Civil War was a sort of revolution, I don't think people just were born again, so to speak. I think much of what we see in Reconstruction comes out of slavery. And that poses a challenge to scholars of slavery mm -hmm. to explain where it comes from. One thing uh, connected to the subject of slave politics is that you see that in many cases are actually like, very effective at least at getting formal consent from the state, but that then the state on the ground in the South doesn't have the ability to follow through. And this, I think, connects with what you were saying earlier about these WPA narratives where African Americans are saying that they felt like they were betrayed by the forces that promises were made. And it's not just 40 acres and a mule, but in lots of individual ways, there are rulings that come down in their favor that then the Reconstruction era state just can't enforce. So how much of this story of Reconstruction is also a story of uh, state incapacity? Well, it, there, it, the state, the, on the well, one that's hand- That's really bulky and problematic. Yeah, no, 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 I, I understand what you're saying. The state, the national state created in the Civil War mm -hmm. is of course, far more capacious than had existed before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And I talk about that, of course, in the lectures and all the different expressions of state power, whether it's the Civil War draft, issuing currency, national banking system, putting us and <laughs> having a gigantic military and fighting a war, uh, although, you know, and many, many others. The state begins to constrict after the war, as it always does, but never back to the level of, vert of total incapacity, mm -hmm. at least at the national level, of before the war. Um, so, but still, it is, not, it is not equipped to enforce the law at the local level. There is no FBI, whether that's good or bad, is an interesting question. The Department of Justice is not created until 1870, and it's a skeletal thing. The only, if you're going to have resistance to the law, you have the federal courts, but even they are very, very limited. The, the jurisdiction of the federal courts is much less expansive than it will become in the 20th century and today. Very few cases can get into federal court, even after the 14th and 15th Amendments. Um, and then you've got the army, but you can't just be using the army all over the place. That, putting an occupying army in 
generally breeds more resentment, <laughs> more opposition than you succeed. You know, Grant did it in a few places with troops, federal marshals to crush the Klan. He did it once, but it became very difficult to do it again. There, even in the North, there are many people, well, this is not a republic if you have the army constantly intervening to enforce the law. So the, the capacity of the national state was, was not such, uh, it seems, unlike fast forward 100 years, mm -hmm. where the national state did have to intervene and did intervene in the South with uh, President Eisenhower sending in the National Guard to Little Rock and mm -hmm. Kennedy sending troops to the University of Mississippi and many other instances, but there you didn't, you know, it wasn't just troops, you had a very robust federal court system by then. Mm -hmm. And it was hard, even George Wallace had to agree <laughs> to step aside from the door when a federal court order was handed to him. Whereas in the Reconstruction South, the uh, federal court order, forget it, we don't have to care about that. Mm -hmm. This question of uh, Grant and the KKK and the sort of very successful use for a time at least of state force raises the connected question of the overall role of violence in this period, which I think for students or people coming to this course without much background in reconstruction, sort of centrality and prevalence of violence would be the most shocking thing. Well, the, the violence was endemic in the South. Uh, there's no question about it. It was uh, from the very end of the war, you know. Uh, I think um, war is politics by other means, and politics in this case seemed to be war by other means. Um, and uh, it posed an insuperable problem, it seems, for local government, state government, um, police. Sometimes overthrown by violence, right? This is what's so striking. Yeah. There's this period of American history, which goes on for quite a while, <laughs> where you can actually have coups, right? I well, the, you didn't, it, what is a coup? Yeah. You, you did have a few cases where they, I mean, like in New Orleans, where they actually seized the government, but then federal troops came and kicked them out. Uh, the Colfax massacre, I guess you could call that a coup, where a local, where a local elected government is thrown out by a uh, violent uprising. Uh, I think more to the point is you had a coup before the election where you had so much violence and intimidation that people could not come out to vote and therefore you have an actual election and somebody wins but they only win because of the process that has taken place violently before the election uh, is, is undertaken. So um, yes, it is given given, and particularly nowadays, or in the last, well, 13 years now, <laughs> since September 11, 2001, uh, the whole idea of homegrown terrorism is probably surprising to most students. We do not think of the United States as a place that generates terrorism. Today, the word terrorism almost always has Islamic as an adjective, mm -hmm. unfairly, but that's how people think about it. It's something that is born overseas by people who look rather fanatical and are of a different religion than most Americans. Mm -hmm. This was Christian terrorism. These people were good, devout Christians. They were ministers who were members of the Ku Klux Klan. So, and this was homegrown. What does that tell us about our history? Maybe it should lead us to think a little more about the role of violence and other, you know, other historians are re-emphasizing, not that people don't know about it, but the role of violence, let us say, in the conquest of the West, the suppression of the Native Americans, a lot of violence involved in that. Um, labor violence, which was quite endemic in this period. This, this period of the Civil War to World War I, there was a lot of violence in the United States, and the Reconstruction was an extreme example, but by no means the only one. This question of the West, though, raises the subject of like where that fits into the story, because, I mean, what we've seen in the class is the West is sort of the significant player, but it's everything that's doing, it's doing is sort of happening off stage. Yeah. So you see that like investments aren't, you, the South can attract capital because there's this much more attractive avenue just a little bit to the West of like where they're trying to get resources. So how yeah. does that fit well, into Well, that's a good story? question. And of course, there has been work on this. Uh, Heather Richardson has written uh, sort of good books on this, and of course, Again, there is a vast literature on the Indian wars, mm -hmm. which are going on in this period and afterwards. In fact, they're going on during the Civil War itself. Mm -hmm. And some of our Civil War generals, like Sheridan and Howard, are out there fighting the Indians after mm -hmm. the war. So they didn't see any discontinuity, so to speak. Um, but there is not, the Indian war literature does not speak to reconstruction. Mm -hmm. The reconstruction literature does not generally speak to what's going on in the West. It would be nice, you know, I think we should expand our horizon, but I am nervous about decentering the South, at least for the period up to 1877. I think what was going on in the South was unique, was uniquely important. Mm -hmm. 
And not that it wasn't important what was going on elsewhere, but I don't think what's going on in the South can just be subsumed into a larger category such as, let us say, nation building or capitalist expansion. That is part of the story, no question about it. But the, but the very, the struggle over the aftermath of slavery mm -hmm. is basically going on in the South. They're not fighting that battle out in the West. They're fighting other battles mm -hmm. out there. And it seems like you could say that what's going on in the West is partly just a consequence of this newly empowered nation state as, like, as a consequence of winning the Civil War. That's then like- Well, we've been fighting the Indians for a long time yeah. before the Civil War. And in fact, some people say that's where state capacity existed before the Civil mm -hmm. War, <laughs> kicking out Indians. You know, the federal government did that over and over again, as we all know. Uh, but um, yes, now it, it's imposed. And the notion of national sovereignty, mm -hmm. Indian sovereignty seems now to be, after the war, a contradiction to the triumph of the nation in the Civil War. Just as they can't accept the secession of the South, they can't accept the existence of alternative sovereignties within the boundaries of the United States. So I think it's 1870 or 71, that the treaty system ends. No more treaties with Native Americans. They claim they're gonna respect the previous treaties, although very often they don't. But um, no more treaties because these are, what are they? They're not really American citizens exactly, but they're in the country and there can be only one sovereign power within the uh, United States after the Civil War. So that certainly the Indian Wars fit into that. And one could go even further and look to the purchase of Alaska, mm -hmm as part of this outward thr this thrust of national consolidation and national power, uh, not created by the Civil War, but certainly given a tremendous new impetus by the Civil War. But we War. started this class talking about how difficult these questions related to expansion were for the politics of the 1850s to handle. Right. So, I mean, could you frame this as, with the slavery question resolved, the national government can now embark in a less troubled fashion on these aggressive <laughs> campaigns for expansion? Well, that's an interesting point. It can, because uh, no longer are they just trying to debate whether these territories would be slave yeah, or exactly. free. It's not all filtered through this particular domestic Right. Dispute. We know Kansas is going to be a free state, or yeah. it is a free state, and we know that uh, Colorado or whatever is going to be a free state. Uh, they do, uh, we didn't talk about this in the class, but the aftermath of the war and slavery in the Indian nations is a very interesting story because some of those Indian nations did own slaves. And had like, wasn't there like a formal seat or a representative for like in some Indian nations in the Confederate government? That's what I believe is the case. Uh, I, I haven't looked at the Confederate constitution lately, but they did offer representation in order to try to get the loyalty of some of these tribes, which were slave owning tribes. Mm -hmm. But of course, losing, those tribes had to abolish slavery. They had to give up a lot of land too, which is the old story. And unlike any other slave owners, they had to give land to their former slaves. The one place land is distributed is in the Indian territory, where some of these ex-slaves get a hold of land for 40 acres. I don't know how many acres they got, but that's the one, that was a punishment, so to speak to the tribes that had sided with the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. The Confederacy itself was not punished in that respect. Mm -hmm.